Okay, Francisco. Yeah. So, hello, everyone. Welcome to this new IEA seminar, the seminar from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía. Uh, this will be the first of the two events that we will be streaming this week, the seminar today and another colloquium tomorrow. So our seminar today has a very nice uh, title, is Turning Trash into Treasure, How OH Megamasers are Contaminating Next Generation H1 Surveys and What They Can Tell Us About Galaxy Evolution. And the seminar will be given by Hilly Roberts. Uh, Hilly is a PhD candidate at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, she studies uh, OH Megamasers and how they contaminate untargeted H1 surveys and what they tell us about galaxy evolution. So she works with multiple uh, H1 surveys, searching for megamasers, including uh, LADUMA, a deep H1 survey on a SCAP precursor Mercat. And outside research, uh, she also works in the juvenile detention system in Colorado, helping students get the, their high school diplomas and get excited about science. And she will be in the postdoc market uh, starting next year. So if you are looking for a postdoc, interested in strange galaxies, uh, please contact her. By the way, she, she will be here at IAA, she will be uh, today, and uh, she will be at Kelly's uh, office, at Kelly Hess office. So if you want, after the, the talk, you want to, to, to talk to her, just go to Kelly's uh, office. Okay, so Helly, if you are ready, it's up to you. Great. Um, thanks so much for the, the intro, and um, thanks everyone for getting this set up for me. Uh, I just showed up to observe at ERAM and a bunch of people have just done so much work to you know make this happen and uh, be available for me. So thanks to everyone, including Kelly, who has also been the, the main progenitor of all of this. Uh, I just really appreciate getting to share my science a little bit, especially when you know it's weird and obscure. Uh, right, so uh, great intro. Uh, I'm gonna really quick go over the talk outline just to give you an idea of what all we're gonna talk about. Uh, so it's going to be, you know, what, what's an OH megamaser, you know, this, this word I keep throwing at you. Um, and then how are they actually contaminating untargeted H1 surveys? I'm also going to talk about how we can mitigate this contamination uh, and show you some, uh, you know, some glimpses of the future of OH megamasers. Uh, and then somewhat sideways step, but, you know, a thing that I'm becoming more and more interested in is, you know, why are so few uh, ULERGs hosting OH megamasers? Uh, and a couple times through this talk, I'm going to stop and recap everything I've said. Um, I talk a little fast sometimes, so if at any point I'm I'm glancing over things or missing things, like please add questions to the chat, and uh, I can stop and clarify things. Great. So, uh, what's an OH mega maser? And I've abbreviated this as OM up at the top, and I will absolutely at some point here start saying OM all the time because it's such a long word, and I just default to it. Uh, so when, when you hear me saying that, that's what I'm talking about, not the, you know, measure of resistance. Um, so an OH mega maser, uh, these are, breaking down the story a little bit, the, the maser, this is an astrophysical laser, but now in the microwave, um, and this emits a radio, and this is specifically at 18 centimeters, um, and mega just means incredibly bright, so uh, 10 to 10,000 times brighter than the luminosity of the sun, um, just in the little, the little uh, center of this OH mega maser here. Uh, we find these mostly in ULERGs, uh, and they're produced uh, in the late stages of major galaxy mergers. So, you know, we have two, two major, uh, two giant galaxies coming to collide, have to be pretty similar in size, have to have tons of dense gas, um, and as that infalls, we can create these little OH clouds that, that uh, you know, uh, stack on top of each other until you have this collimated type beam that we can see uh, shoots out in all directions, but we also see it, you know, from where we are here. Uh, and this is produced, yeah, in late stage major galaxy mergers. Um, we cannot find many of these. There's only about 120 that we know of. Uh, and they're all pretty low redshift, all less than 0.265. And uh, this is a spoiler, but this is a record that was broke, um, you know, just, just this month. So, so we'll talk about that at the end here. But up until 1992, the highest redshift OH mega maser we knew of was uh, only as high as 0.265. So it's kind of uh, an exciting time to be studying these. Um, the OH mega maser line is incredibly uh, interesting. It can tell us just a ton, a ton of like unique science just by you know just by a spectral line. So um, in the OH uh, mega masers, there's four 
four amazing lines, two amazing lines at 16, 67, and 65 megahertz, um, 67 being a little bit brighter than the 65. And then there's uh, two satellite lines at 16, 12, and 17, 20 megahertz. In uh, you know thermodynamic equilibrium, there's a you know an idea of how uh, what the ratio of these lines should be. Um, in in theory, what we or in practice, what we see is a is a wide range of uh, ratios of uh, line measurements, and this is all incredibly interesting because it can tell you you know what kind of pumping you have in your maser, like what kind of dynamics are going on to fill some um, energy levels and not others. So these are all you know there's just a wealth of science just in you know these spectral lines, um, but we've really not found many of them of the satellite lines specifically. We've only found about four of the 16, 12 megahertz lines. So a lot of like untapped, untapped, interesting stuff there. Uh, right, take a drink of water. Uh, you know I care about which big masers. There's about 120 of them. It's always a hard thing to convince other people to care about them. Uh, but you know. They have just a wealth of information in them. And so I'm gonna go over a couple of different, you know, unique science cases, but I promise you'll you'll love them by the end. So uh, by detecting or by counting the number of OH megamasers that you have um, over redshift, you can actually measure the major merger evolution rate with them, which I think is fascinating. Uh, they are also markers of some of the most extreme um, star formation, uh, gas density, far IR, far IR radiation in the universe. So, you know, looking at those, you can trace uh, how that changes over uh, redshift as well. And then you can also use them for in situ uh, measurements of magnetic fields using Zeeman splitting, which has been done uh, more than a couple of times, but it's it's a really fascinating way to get a, a glance at, you know, galaxies that we don't usually see. So they're incredibly unique and interesting, but with only 120, it's a matter of, you know, how do we find them? But don't worry, they're going to be in your data anyway, because all these untargeted H1 surveys that we have coming up in these next generation surveys, uh, next generation telescopes, uh, they're going to they're going to be spoofing or you know pretending to be these little um, H1 emission lines. So in this figure up on top, with my mouse, uh, this is a an example of a 1667 um, OH megamaser line, and down here is the 21 centimeter neutral hydrogen line, and because it's at you know 18 centimeters and 21 centimeters or 1667 megahertz and 1420 megahertz. Um, OH megamasers at a higher redshift um, can actually get confused to be H1 uh, emission lines. So that's shown by this little equation here. So it works out that if you are observing and you don't have um, confirmed redshifts for your sources, so you you see a line at uh, you know redshift 0 0.01, um, it's likely to be an h1 emitter at 0 0.01 or it's an you know there's a world where it's an oh magnetizer at redshift 0 0.19 so it's a it's been documented to happen a couple times alfalfa has a few of these um alfalfa was an h1 survey in Arecibo, um but uh it's only it's only really gonna get worse from here with all these uh upcoming h1 surveys and uh this so this next slide uh people are always telling me that they think that they would know the difference between um OH line and an H1 line. So you know, here's here's a here's a preview of what they look like. Uh, and then here is uh, eight lines pulled randomly from alfalfa, and then one OH megamaser that was also detected by alfalfa. So you know, I'm gonna let people just scan here for a minute and decide what they think is the OH megamaser and not the H1 line. Uh, we can think, we can think. You know, there's some some things are obvious. Like here's a nice little double horn profile. It's so probably not that one. Um, but hopefully you all have in your head what you think it is by now, but it's this one. Um, and it's nothing remarkable looking at the line. I don't see it in COH Megamazer, but I think this is, uh, you know, driving home the point of you, you can't just trust that you're going to see a line and know that it's, it's coming from, you know, an, a typical spiral galaxy instead of a, you know, major merger. So I think it's, I think it's a, it's an exciting time to be uh, unsure of what you're looking at. Um, so we've done a ton of uh, calculations and you know uh, estimations of how this uh, contamination is going to change for a bunch of upcoming H1 surveys. Um, I've listed a couple here that I think are particularly interesting and demonstrate my point, but uh, 
our paper from 2021 has a ton of different surveys. Uh, but for Laduma, which Laduma is a single pointing high redshift um, survey, uh, and same for SK1 deep, which are similar in size and uh, redshift, um, this this OH contamination is going to be you know over one percent up to ten percent, um, and that's just due to the fact that at higher redshifts, um, since OH regulators are produced from major mergers, your frequency is going to increase uh, with redshift, uh, whereas H1 actually decreases. So up until around a redshift of two, there should be more OH megamasers. Uh, and so this is, this is going to be causing a lot of problems for those. Um, for all sky surveys, and this has been the case for alfalfa, this has not been too much of an issue. Uh, but still, you know, you're going to be detecting hundreds, if not thousands of OH megamasers in these next generation surveys. Uh, and you're going to want to know what to do with that data. Um, Zooming in here on the SK1 deep here, which is you know one of the higher percent contaminations, uh, this is particularly an issue uh, when you have uh, these. So so okay, real quick down here I have um, ZH1, which is that if you are looking at a source and you think the line is uh, an H1 line, what the redshift would be. But there's actually that you know back to that equation I showed. There's a corollary uh, OH redshift that you would have. So this goes from zero to 1.25, but the OH redshift is actually going to go from 0.17 to 1.87. So that's that's this range here. So uh, this solid line shows how your H1 number density is going to change over redshift. This dashed line shows how your OH number density is going to change over redshift. And this blue line shows that at some point, you're actually going to have a crossover where you're detecting more uh, OH megamasers than H1 sources. So that's shown here. Um, it's not until about a redshift of 1.25, uh, but it's still an interesting uh, issue that we're going to be dealing with and, you know, preparing for all these SKA precursors. Uh, I think this is like the time to start thinking, you know, how do we, how do we figure out which ones are actually uh, OH omega majors versus H1 sources? So here's one of my recap slides, just really quick going over everything I just told you. So, you know, OH omega majors, they're rare, luminous majors produced by major galaxy mergers. Um, the OH line, uh, Produced by OH regulators can spoof or pretend to be this H1 line at a higher redshift. Um, and it can be contaminating all your data in your untargeted H1 surveys. Uh, this contamination hasn't been a big issue yet, uh, just because we're looking at a bunch of uh, low redshift all sky surveys where you're going to preference um, H1 sources over OH. Uh, but that's about to change. So we have to figure out a way to start sorting OH from H1. So how are we going to do that? So we've known for a while that uh, near to mid IR photometry can separate these groups um, decently well, but that's actually going to change a lot with redshift, especially as we have these high redshift surveys. So here uh, I'm showing wide photometry. So um, bands W1, W2 are 3.4 and 4.6 microns, um, W1 magnitude on the y-axis, and then a W1, W2 color on the x-axis. Um, and what you're seeing is a uh, simulated photometry over redshift for OH and H1 populations, where H1 is this red blob and OH is this blue blob. Uh, and this gray line here is the, the nominal detection limit, but uh, it's, it's actually more of a, you know, a curve than a line. Um, but you can see that, you know, though the, the blobs are, you know, are separable at times, so H1 and OH, you know, exist in different regions, uh, there are times where they completely uh, overlap, which is right there, where, you know, if you're looking at, a, you know, a redshift of, say, 0.3 for each one, you are going to have, like, your two populations laying on top of each other, which is, uh, makes it almost indistinguishable for just picking out a source and deciding uh, what it is. So we, we took the approach, uh, as everyone does in astronomy these days, of, you know, can we use machine learning? Uh, and this is, this is always a question of, you know, when you're, when you're using machine learning, you have to think, like, what am I actually, what am I actually training something to do? Like, am I training it to do it, um, to, to predict on something that I don't understand? Or am I actually like utilizing the, the knowledge I have in my data to uh, create a model that I can understand? So this was a thing I was, I was really worried about was producing, you know, a black box versus, uh, you know, informed, informed guessing. Uh, so the way that we went about doing this was using a K nearest neighbors algorithm. 
And so the way that a Canier saver algorithm works is that, uh, you know, say you have a, um, a little point in a parameter space and pretend this is a, you know, X and Y parameter space. And so you have this like green dot and you, you're trying to figure out what it is. Is it, is it a, you know, a blue square or a red triangle? And so the Canier saver algorithm works by uh, looking at the objects around that, op that source and then voting on what it thinks it is based on like just who's around it. So, you know, if you have, uh, if you're using a K of, which a K is the number of neighbors, a K of three, that's the circle right here. Um, it's gonna classify the green dot as a red triangle because it has two red triangles next to it versus one uh, blue square. If you have K neighbors of five, so include five neighbors, that's this one, it's gonna classify it as a blue square. Um, this is a really interesting type of machine learning called lazy learning, which is where it makes absolutely no assumptions on what your data is saying. It's just using your data in order to create a parameter space that can then classify your objects based on that. So, you know, when we're optimizing it, we're optimizing the number of parameters that you give it, the number of neighbors that you give it, um, et cetera. This is really helpful for not creating, you know, some kind of uh, neural network where you're not sure what the convolution is doing all the way through, but instead of creating this uh, more of a matrix that's or more of a, yeah, a matrix that's a prob probability density function of, you know, based on what has already existed, you know, what is this one going to be, but in a way that we don't have to um, plot a million points every time. So this is what we implemented. Uh, and then we can uh, test it with some, we've tested it with uh, mostly existing H1 surveys at this point in this plot, um, since this is mostly off alpha data. But, you know, say we have all this, um, oh, and, and uh, simulated data, because with 120 OH fang masers, we have to, you know, <laughs> we need more to figure it out. So a lot of these are just um, taking OH fang maser SCDs and then messing with them, or major major SCDs and messing with them and trying to figure out if this can still mess, still detect them. So if we feed it um, this plot, which is predictions, where it's 50, 50, H1 and OH, and you can see in this wide magnitude color space, how they lay, we feed that to the algorithm. Um, here's its results, which are uh, mostly classifications. Um, these are the great points. It's over 99.7% correct. And then here are these piles of um, mistakes, basically. But it when it when it tells you uh, if it's OH or H1, since it's a probability density function, you get um, you know anything from a zero to a one. So it was wrong on what things these are, but it also tells us that it's 50% confident or 70% confident. So this has been an exciting, exciting uh, algorithm to use and figure this out, but it works pretty well. And we've done this with lines data. We've done this with um, sister data as well, which is really great for the higher redshift um, data, especially in Laduma, which is in a field that has significant spitzer coverage. Um, this is where we've started working with Aperteaf, um, specifically the a preliminary catalog from the Aperteaf Wide Area Extragalactic Survey, which Kelly was so phenomenal of sharing with me and letting us get a chance to just run this through and seeing if it works at all, because uh, it's terrifying to create something and then not having real data to test it on. So this was an early source finding catalog that was provided to us um, from Kelly. It has about 4.5 months of data in it um, and about 1,200 sources. And so we were able to, you know, run that through and, and see if see if this works. Uh, and it it you know, every time you test something, you find uh, initial shortcomings. And one of them was that it really really likes low surface brightness galaxies as well. So you know, if you're looking for a, you know, OH mega maser finding algorithm, I have that. But if you're also looking for low surface brightness galaxies, we have those too. Um, so we have, so we found a bunch of those issues and we were able to, you know, implement and change and edit so that now, you know, instead of just voting based on um, IR, it's using also um, optical brightness, which helps a lot and also can now nicely sort H1 from low surface brightness to H1. Um, but we we're also able to confirm that it does find uh, an OHA laser. So this is uh, IROS 10597. Um, and we had, this is a previously detected OH mega maser, um, and Kelly had actually found this one, I believe, by eye, uh, but our algorithm also picked up on it, which was fantastic in confirming that it actually does what we wanted it to do.
Um, but though this one had been detected before, it had only been detected in the 1667 line, um, and it had uh, not great measurements made previously, but even just with aperitif data, we were able to learn so much more about this OH mega laser. So, you know, here you can see the 1665, 67 line, and the 65 line as well. And there's also a one in three chance that 1612 line was detected, which is amazing because with only four measurements, the fact that aperitif was able to pick up uh, that in so little data is phenomenal. It's also one of the highest redshift OH mega was one of the highest redshift OH mega lasers, uh, a redshift of 0.196 and one of the brightest. And so 10597 has been an interesting case, like a fascinating case study of, you know, just just how much you more, how much more data you can learn um, with these next generation H1 surveys. Uh, we were also able to, with this catalog, te test all of these predictions for the number of um, OH main lasers. I've, you know, so happily said that we can detect. So in the in our paper from 2021, I showed you this like table of contamination rates. Uh, and so for aperitif, we have guessed the 0 0.09% uh, percent contamination rate. And on 1,200 sources, that was the preliminary info catalog. I searched. We didn't really find any other OH mega lasers. It's a bunch of optical searching too to check redshifts. And there's looks like there's only one, which is uh, consistent with what our guesses are. So this is going to be a, a constantly changing um, prediction rate, especially with the higher redshift uh, data since it's informed on so so little known about OH mega lasers at high redshifts. But um, it's exciting to be able to you know check that what we do know, the very little that we do know, is holding up. Um, we also were able to make predictions for how many more of these uh, satellite lines we might find with, you know, say, Aberdeen. Uh, and it's exciting just to see how, you know, we're going to be picking up more of these uh, 16, 12 lines when so few had been detected previously. Okay, second recap. Uh, we can use the K-nearest neighbors algorithm to uh, Oh, we can use k nearest neighbors classification to train an algorithm on near to mid IR photometry in order to start disentangling these OH and H1 populations and, uh, you know, also in parentheses, low surface brightness galaxies. Uh, the first test of these algorithms on aperitif data has revealed some, some of these initial shortcomings, but uh, it's allowed us to further refine the algorithm and we are actually publishing an update that uh, this summer, so that'll be exciting. Um, we were also able to confirm that it does work, though. Like, it might be picking up low surface brightness galaxies, but it's also going to pick up the OH finger lasers that we, we wanted to find. So that was exciting. Uh, and these next, these next generation H1 surveys are going to be finding an unprecedented number of OH finger lasers and tell us more than we've ever, ever been able to know about them. Uh, and that's where, you know, our paths have intertwined. And it's like, could not have picked a better timing to be giving this talk. Uh, this is a press release from the IAA uh, of the Dumas most recent, our first scientific discovery, really, which is this new uh, high redshift OH mega maser that we found. Um, and we're calling it Nakalakapa, I think I'm saying that right, uh, which was uh, um, voted on by the community uh, or submitted by the community for, you know, uh, recommendations of names for uh, this, you know, this giant OH mega maser, which has been really exciting. And so, so Nakalakapa, is a um, is Zulu, which is the, the language spoken in uh, South Africa, word for um, big boss. So it's been it's been fun getting to you know integrate the community here a little bit. But also, you know, IAA had a hand in this too. Uh, it's been exciting just because having all this SK precursor work and all this going on. Uh, yeah, couldn't have asked for a better better time to giving this talk. But just to talk about this a little bit and how exciting this is. Uh, this was data taken in one night of observing on Meerkat, um, which is uh, just kind of crazy when you think about it. And in one night of observing, we <laughs> broke the broke the redshift uh, record holder for OH mega lasers by you know from 0.265 to 0.5225, uh, and it's also an incredibly bright source. So here's the the spectral line from the paper, and this is all in the paper that that um, that just came out and or just hit archive at least and. It's also linked to in the IAA um, press release, but here's you know here's a little optical image of this 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 distant OH mega laser which uh, 
we have we have Hubble proposal. Uh, we have some Hubble orbits coming in. Hopefully, we'll shed some light on what this what the sky actually looks like. But it's um, it's, a, it's an exciting time. It's also yeah. So it's also one of the brightest ocean masers. Um, like I said, the the range of ocean maser luminosities is from ten to ten to the four L sun. Above that, we call them we call them giga masers. There's a couple that are above uh, ten to the four, uh, but not many. There's, we call them giga masers. They're all ocean masers. Um, and so, you know, in, in one night, we've picked up some of the most interesting data that we could be looking at. Uh, in the paper, we also talked about how this algorithm worked on this data as well. So here is the same uh, color-wise magnitude plots that I was showing earlier. So here's W1, W1 over minus W2. And then there's another one, another algorithm we wrote that's a, a color color of W1 minus W2 and W2 minus W3. And so here you can see where, where the source lives uh, on this. And so the, the contours are actually um, laid out by uh, sources that are in a similar redshift range. So, you know, because if you think of that plot where they're like the little blobs are moving around, um, this is just if we picked one of those blobs to look at and then put the contour, contours down. And then here's our uh, new discovery. So it lands uh, in the 99 percentile to be an OH mega maser in this one. And this one that lands in the, I think, 95 percentile to be an OH mega maser. So uh, it's also nice to see that it still works here, too. And it's going to be even more exciting once we have um, more Laduma surveys or more Laduma um, sources to be looking at. So uh, Laduma is going to be able to detect OH mega masers out to a range of 1.87. Uh, it'll put a really nice constraint on the merger rate because Laduma is a single pointing. So, you know, just by counting the number of OH wing lasers that you find uh, as a function of redshift uh, is a, uh, a great test of what we understand about the merger rate to be. Um, and then we also have not been able to update the OH luminosity function above uh, redshift of 0.26. So we're already seeing that that's going to get updated, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, and then here's where I here's where I stop, and I'm going to step this sideways a little bit because we're on this we're on this era we're on this cusp of all these new OH mega major detections. Um, but do we actually under like a, a question I've been asking myself like do we actually understand OH mega majors? So um, I've been plagued by thinking about you know why why you learn are not not all producing OH mega majors. So when we do um, surveys of Eulers and look for uh, OH mega masers, only about 80 or over 80% of Eulers show no sign of mazing whatsoever. Um, that's including H2 uh, uh, water mega masers, but it's still a, a question of, you know, what makes, at what point in Euler uh, evolution are we, we shutting off to the side to produce OH mega masers and what's causing that? The theory for a while has been that it's this, this dense gas fraction. So dense gas fraction. Uh, we can measure this by measuring, you know, HCN luminosity and comparing that to the CO luminosity. And so HCN is tracing the amount of dense gas in a galaxy, and CO is tracing the amount of total gas in a galaxy. And what seems to separate, or what seemed in 2007 to separate OH mega majors from non mazing Eulers, is that you're going to have, you know, these, these non mazing Eulers down here with really low dense gas fractions or total dense co gas content compared to their, or dense gas content compared to their total gas content. And OH mega masers seem to have more. But then we when we had this new uh, aperitif data, we were like, hmm, I wonder where this lives on it. This is where uh, we started taking data with the 30 meter up at EROM. And it lived all the way up here at this incredibly high dense gas fraction that we, had, we just had not measured before. And so it was a moment that we all stopped and thought, hmm, like, is this, is this real? Is this actually just an incredibly dense gas rich galaxy? Or is there something that we're missing here? Is this, is this like a disconnected point from the rest of these? And so spent a little bit longer digging through data and trying to find any more <laughs> HCN and CO um, uh, measurements in order to fill this plot in a little bit. And here we went from, I think this Darling Sun 7 work had 17 uh, non mazing Eulergs and eight OH mega masers to now 42 non mazing Eulergs and now 27 OH mega masers um, using just data in the literature that had been updated since 2007. 
And the, 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 the break of, you know, non amazing you learn to use or to, I wish my makers seems to have like blurred out a little bit, not so, not so stark. Uh, and then I'm also, I've also still been bothered by uh, this galaxy living way up here. And there's huge error bars on it to, you know, call out the obvious, but it's still, a, it's still, it's still too big. Uh, so this is where we started using the, um, doing this, we've been in this uh, long proposal, long campaign for getting uh, more, more OH Mega Mather data to figure out, you know, what's going on. Is, is IRAS 10597 uh, a unique case or is this um, a symptom of a bigger picture that we're not seeing? And so in this plot, I'm showing the OH luminosity versus dense gas fraction. Uh, and you can see the, the very big gap in data that we're missing. Um, which is uh, OH, uh, OH mag masers with uh, particularly luminous uh, masers. So if we if we compare the number of OH mag masers that we know, which is this unfilled plot, um, this is redshift, a histogram of redshift, and a histogram of OH luminosity, compared to those that we have dense gas fractions for, um, we're severely limited on data. Uh, we've been, you know, extrapolating how we think OH mega masers are separate from Euler's based on um, ex like an extremely limited amount of data and extremely uh, like not representative amount of data. So all of our data is based on this low redshift and uh, very few uh, variety in uh, OH luminosity mega masers. So, and then here you can see where this new this new source is living up here at Redshift point two and uh, incredibly luminous uh, OH mega masers. So it's it's this is the the work that has brought me here to Granada and the amazing people that I've gotten to meet and work on. But uh, I don't have an answer for you yet. It's just uh, I think you should also be concerned. We're gonna I'm gonna make us all very concerned about this. And uh, it's an, it's an exciting time to be you know looking at these and figuring out like what's going on with OH mega masers. But also it's very terrifying when you realize that we just have so little data based on them. Um, so yeah, so just real quick going over conclusions. Uh, the OH contamination in HM surveys is gonna be an imminent issue. Um, we should be concerned. We should be figuring out how to uh, mitigate this issue. Uh, photometry, uh, mid, mid to near IR photometry and these k near Hebrew algorithms can help quite a bit, but we still just don't have enough information about OH mega masers to understand the population fully. Uh, so we should be trying to do that as well in order to properly prepare and you know utilize the full range of science that we can use which make majors to do um and i can leave this up and then here's a bunch of resources and other things about me that you can find uh and so i mean hopefully i've convinced you that you should you should care about these weird galaxies uh but yeah i'm happy to answer any questions or um go over anything else Okay, thank you for this uh, nice uh, presentation. And in particular, I thank you for the, uh, telling us about this in Catalath or how, how it's called Mega Mesa, because I passed all the mornings in the screen in the institute and I wonder what was this object with this strange name. And now <laughs> I know. So thank you. So now we are going to the questions and they are going to be managed by Kelly. So if you have questions, please raise your hands and Kelly will. Be. Yes, you can also put questions in the chat um, if you feel most comfortable doing that. Uh, so, um, uh, Ananthan has a question. Uh, okay, so you use K nearest neighbors in like a 2D space. Have you thought about expanding to use a higher dimensional uh, classification or clustering algorithm that might help uh, you know further find features that we might not be able to see directly? Yeah, so this is showing um, the the the, the two-dimensional space. Um, magnitude versus color. But when we, 
start adding in, and we, so there's a dimension that is missing here that I, I didn't talk about, but I'm, I feed it actually the, the frequency of the line that's found too. And that's just to help, um, you know, motivate using this kind of idea of like, sometimes they're more separable than the others, but just having like where you think that, what redshift that line should be at um, helps a lot. So there's, those are the three dimensions that I, I initially go in. So it's, you know, the two, the two axes here and then that observed frequency. Um, we, we did a bunch of working with, you know, uh, there's, there's all these different ideas of, uh, you know, add, add a bunch, and then you can do a, a leave one out method, which is where you, you give it a, a bunch of data, and then you remove a point and then see how it does. Um, and it, it just seemed like the more photometry you gave it, the more it got confused, or the more lines it could draw of like where it thinks um, it should be. And we did also, we tried, um, Oh gosh, LDA linear decomposition decomposition analysis, which tries to you know create create these variables based on the potential you give it, but it it really just seems like the the introduction of you know more more bands or more colors seem to make them overlap more than less, which was a weird thing. But I didn't want to do too much to mess with them because I I really didn't want to. Like, you know, you look at this and you understand what's going on in this plot. You're like, oh, okay, they, they overlap with them. They don't. And I, I didn't want to create a, a box I didn't understand. So partially, partially it didn't work. And then partially I didn't, I didn't want to make it too complicated. <laughs> yeah. All right, other questions? Um, I can also ask one. Um, I was thinking about uh, machine learning, and um, there's an increasing number of um, uh, surveys that use, well, for example, you can start with Galaxy Zoo, where you classify the optical morphology of galaxies, um, but I think people are also trying to automate this in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about, uh, is it easy or possible to sort of um, use the optical morphology as another um, way to get a handle on what the host galaxies look like and separate H1 from OH mega maser hosts. For example, you showed the low surface brightness objects were, were contaminants. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to do that in sort of an automated way? Um, yes, I love this question because this is the exact question I gave uh, an undergrad who works for me. Um, and so he, he's been working on this, of, um, using exact, uh, Galaxy Zoo merger data and then um, alfalfa uh, uh, data to create these, well, Galaxy Zoo mergers is this catalog where people voted on whether or not they think these are mergers. Um, and so that, now there's like this really clean catalog of just nice SCSS mergers. And then Alfalfa has an extreme SCSS overlap. So he's been using um, images from both of those uh, from SCSS in order to do this, the same machine learning, but with um, optical uh, morphology. He uses uh, like, the morphology parameters. So, um, Fairsic index, uh, oh gosh, uh, CAS, which is concentration, asymmetry, and clumpiness, um, and Genie M20. Uh, and he is wrapping up his work with that right now, but it is extremely successful. Um, it's very good at finding it. It comes out a similar way of, um, because he, for his, he does do, uh, PCA decomposition. And so, like, you know, creating a, 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 a variable in which you can separate these two populations based on those morphology parameters. Uh, and it works really well. The big, the, the big asterisk here is that uh, <laughs> it's harder for you know, high redshift surveys to implement morphology because we just don't have these like high resolution images that inform anything interesting. Uh, I mean, you can see from the, the oh, let's see if I can find it real quick. The Laduma uh, image that there's just, uh, so little about this that would tell you whether or not this this galaxy is a I mean I can't even tell you this is a merger with any confidence other than the fact that like it's an OH mega maser so it, it must be um and so that's that's the the main limitation and then the other limitation is that many of the upcoming H1 surveys are going to be in the southern hemisphere uh and the the also available optical data for the southern hemisphere is mostly just pan stars which has a lot more noise and the fitting these um morphology parameters it gets much more difficult to do so in a way that uh, doesn't create a ton of noise or statistical uh, variation. 
And so I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if like maybe, maybe don't go for um, morphological parameters for, for PanStars images um, or, or what the future is going to look like there, but I'm, I'm not sure how we're going to handle that part, but morphology works for SESS is the, is the short answer. <laughs> cool, thanks. Um, I guess I can ask one more question, and that is that um, your OH MIGMAS researches are really currently piggybacking on a lot of the H1 surveys that are upcoming with or existing with SKA precursors. If you had to design your own OH MIGMAS survey, what would you do that would be different? Uh, this is a cop out answer, but I would make Laduma. <laughs> Laduma's going to, Laduma has the, this, uh, this, I guess SK1D, this OH main research are just going to be so much more common at higher redshifts uh, that it's just a matter of, you know, reaching those lower frequencies uh, in order to detect them in the first place. It's, it's incredibly difficult to predict where we're going to find these. There's like, for two decades, people would do these searches of just ULERGs of like, well, ULERGs must have OH mega masers. Uh, so we'll just scan them and it's just paper after paper after paper of like, we looked in 40 ULERGs and found nothing, we looked in 50 ULERGs, we found nothing, we looked in 100. And so I think that like creating a survey wherein like you're going to find them, it's just like not, it, it's just not like totally, I'm not sure what you would do because we just don't actually know how they're produced or like what exact scenario you need. Um, so I think it's, it's just really going to be in an era where we're going to have this high redshift. Um, H1 or OH data in order to start figuring out, you know, are they more common at higher redshifts, which is mostly a, a guess, an informed guess, but a guess. And then, um, you know, what kind of galaxies are we actually finding them in and not just, you know, alpha alpha, which is something like 30,000 H1 sources. And of that, it picked up like 14 OH ray lasers. So it's it's hard, it's hard to predict. I, I popped out of your, your question, but. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right, are there any other uh, questions from the audience? Yes, Amidou. Yes, um, this is very interesting. So I have a, a very, um, maybe simple or a complex question, depending. But the way you've predicted the um, incidence of, of mega masses, you know, using um, KNN on, um, on infrared images, so do you think it's possible at some point to just um, use, you know, a similar technique on the um, on the uh, spectra only? Like at the beginning of the talk, you presented, you know, some uh, cases where you you had, you know, different uh, profiles, and then you kind of detect what uh, what is H one and what is OH. Yeah, great question. Um... I have thought about this so much because I, I, I do believe there should, there should be a way. Um, one idea that I, I think might work um, is one of the unique things about the OH line is that you have this 16, 67, and 65 line. Um, and so I don't, uh, I've not worked with a lot of like big spectral surveys before, but I've, I've wondered if you can't do um, profile matching to like lag potential um, candidates. So, you know, like, if, if we think that the, mm, do I have a picture of a 65 line? Uh, it's a little bit here, but you can see this little like pump from the 65 and the 67 line, or mm, it's actually flipped. So this is just a weird looking line. Uh, but if once you have, oh, oh, oh I have the active one. Um, yeah, here we go. The 1665, 67 line. If we can do like matching of like what those look like in order to like try to pick up always oh, trigger from from there, that would be great. But the 1665 line doesn't always show up. Is like a weird issue that we we don't understand. Um, we they can get lost in the noise, but then sometimes just the line ratios are just so vastly different from you know which populations are actually getting or which uh, energy levels are actually getting populated. Um, so like that's one idea that I've had. But then otherwise, um, besides doing the opposite for H one, which is matching the you know the, the double horn profile uh, and just trying to you know immediately grab those, I'm not really sure how the spectra if the spectra can, can provide enough information 
in order to like find these. Um, you know, this is this is a, a a place where it's like I feel like there's there's we just need more data and more time in order to start understanding what what the spectra looks like. The the other the other really weird issue with which makes lasers is because they're they're born out of galaxy mergers where you have like these OH clouds like flying around. Um, the lines are incredibly broad, so it also tends to smooth out a lot of the features that you might want to see in them, which is also can happen uh, in H one lines as well. So. Uh, it's a good question, and I've I've thought about it, and then been very unsure of how to how to address it. And thank you all for hanging out with me while I talk about these weird galaxies for a while, and then uh, and the questions and everything. I, I love getting a chance to talk about this. Nice. Are there uh, any final questions, perhaps? Um, if not, Haley's going to be hanging out in my office for today and maybe tomorrow as well. It's just tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, I'm in the basement of the C building, so you're welcome to stop by and have a chat. Um, after Haley leaves, I'm also still around uh, and happy to talk about uh, my more limited knowledge of OH Mega Mazers, but uh, some of the projects that I'm also involved with. So. Um, with that, I'd like to thank Haley very much for coming to visit us here in Granada, and thank you for the very nice talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Haley. So I think Rene will stop recording now. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly, uh, Kelly and Haley, and I stop recording now.